Um, there's this interesting feature from Garant's door. I'm pretty sure you're familiar with who Garant's door is. Um, she was the ex, famously the ex girlfriend of uh, Scott Schumer from uh, what's his flipping website called again? Oh bloody hell! What's Scott Schumer's blogger called again? Let me know. If Let's pause that. Scott Schumer, Schumann. What's his blog again? What's his blog? What's his blog? What's his blog? The Sartorialist. You remember this guy? Yeah, that's it. Now I remember it. Cool. Oh, he changed the website. Okay, cool. So, um, this interesting story about um Garen Store, who's the former, who's the ex, sorry, ex girlfriend of uh Scott Schumann of the Sartorialist website. And if you're not familiar with the Sartorialist, what the hell have you been? It's this um obviously influential street style blog or street style vlog blog here for the most part that um, was basically the first one around, I think, that kind of ushered in the whole street style trend. Um, most of it was, I think in the beginning, was concentrated around the editors who surrounded the magazines and stuff, but then he kind of took a little bit of a detour and started to profile all, this, all the people that kind of surrounded the fashion scene. Then it kind of spilled out into just him visiting loads of beautiful places, mostly in Italy and France, and just kind of capturing everyday people and just taking, you know, kind of focusing on some of the details of the outfits that could potentially lead into other trends or just other interesting ways to wear particular items whether it be scarves overcoats knitted tops uh heels just a really cool um mood board of loads of different kind of um street style pictures from all over the road right just an, an, an all-in-all dope dude and at the time i remember scott schumann and garen store were a pretty cool power couple or it couple in fashion um Garen Store had her own little lane that she was kind of doing a little bit more artisanal, I would say, a little bit more boutique, um, a little bit more niche. And then, you know, Sartorius seemed to be the one, you know, scotching into one, smooching with all the kind of higher ups in the fashion scene. And obviously they split and she went on to do other things. She set up a sort of studio, had her own little magazine that she did. But if you look at her online magazine, which I think is Garen's Door, just Door, I forgot the name of it. Let me just see if I can, if I can find it, actually. So Garen's Door... Matt blog what is it called again i haven't been on it in ages though okay we are we are door right and it's like a it's like an online lifestyle sort of like magazine mostly um concentrated towards women and when i used to read it i don't read it too often because you know most of the most of the articles don't really have any um don't pertain to me or have any kind of relevance to me in that regard but it's always good to kind of check in and see what she's doing it it seemed as if it was mostly um focused upon lifestyle and just upon career stuff health and wellness and it was less so about the kind of quote-unquote traditional trendy fashion sort of stuff it seems like she kind of moved away from it i got the feeling anyway in general but it seems like a natural evolution i guess if you have spent that long in fashion especially you know sitting on front rows and just you know i don't know taking you know the gifts of like bags and scarves and you know um, discounts off the line whatever it may be in the showroom it gets to a point when you get a bit older where you know you need to make some money you need to pay rent you you, you want to raise a family you got a dog whatever it may be right so you need to kind of like move into other ways other avenues of revenue stream and I'd, I'd imagine the fashion media landscape isn't as um fruitful as it as people like to like it like you to believe especially if you're somebody of any kind of notoriety or influence there's only so much money that's probably going around those the same amount the same five or ten people so she kind of broadened her her audience broadened her scope kind of invited loads of different women to sort of kind of guest blog on her online magazine i guess um there are some cool features on there where she kind of profiles people and their careers and what they get up to i think this one here at the top is probably one of them um and it's just kind of a real holistic view and it focuses on the entire person um you know those kind of websites that you get for the most part that sort of focus on creative um artistic entrepreneurial types and kind of you know untrusted kind of a little peek into what they do their everyday life um motivation career direction whatever maybe just cool stuff this lady's apartment's bloody beautiful who is this woman claire marie rutledge wow so yeah really cool and inspiring stuff so anyway that's enough about garen store overall so she gave a, she gave a really cool interview or she gave a really cool um, talk at the Business of Fashion Voices um, conference that happened, I think, quite recently, where she basically detailed why she essentially quit Fashion Week and why she fell out of fashion overall. And I was surprised to see the title, but then once you read the article, it kind of makes sense. But it sort of, it sort of explains why I kind of felt, especially kind of watching her from afar, it kind of felt as if she was pur pur purposely moving away from the quote-unquote uh, fashion world, especially the front world world, and kind of just focusing more on just... Um, a career in those artistic endeavors as opposed to kind of sitting in the front row because i've always long argued i think that's one of the reasons london kind of gets held back a bit and some of the 
talent that we have kind of gets wasted because I think a lot of the kids in the fashion universities, I think they are more enamored or more kind of, you know, um, they're more drawn in by the idea of being involved in fashion primarily due to what they see on the front row or what they see on the runway. And I think fashion in general or any kind of creative artistic field, there's a bigger business in and around it or a, uh, behind all of that nonsense. I think the, the runway and the fashion shows are one side of fashion, but there's other bits that you can kind of get involved with. I look at it in the terms of like, you know, a really cool vintage boutique sometime. It's a good example. I'm sure when St. Laurent popped up, vintage boutiques went through an entire renaissance, right? Because essentially you could get that St. Laurent, Heidi Semaine look at vintage shops. But then there are times when vintage shops are not in vogue anymore. And people want to buy quote unquote new clothes. So to be the kind of vintage shop owner, and to just kind of do that really well and to have your little boutique somewhere where you buy really well, you have fairly fairly, re- uh, fairly fair prices, you have a really cool, interesting, diverse cast of staff members, you have a really good social media game. And just be doing that year in, year out, outside of the whole fashion bubble is what I see as a quite um, achievable target for a lot of people as opposed to kids in universities aiming to be the next John Galliano, which is, you know, reserved for the 1% of the 1%ers. Um, there's a, it's like a professional football it's the same sort of thing right um, instead of kind of trying to focus your efforts on trying to become a professional footballer why not try and if you're interested in football and you want to be involved in that world why not try and become an agent why not try and become a coach uh, a recruitment analyst um, a PR person marketing manager something where you're still involved in that world without being on the front lines because that well, that side of the industry is is kind of something that you can probably do for a longer time than it, you know, you being the star player, especially in the football world, right? You're only, what, you probably got a 20 year, a 20 year career for the most part, right? 35 is probably when most uh, footballers retire. So I'd imagine the same sort of thing happens in fashion. You know, there's only so long you can become, you are the cool it one, especially on the, on the front row circuit. So anyway, she detailed this whole experience in his article featured on the business of fashion i'll quickly read through it's titled as following uh i'll put it in the show notes as well for you guys to read if you want to check it out yourselves but it's, t- it's titled why gangster quit fashion the famous illustrator and street style photographer explained why she abandoned the front row stage at bf of the Prince of Fashion Voice. Oh yeah, I've got to say she was a photographer too, so or still is a photographer. Um so Oxfordshire, United Kingdom. Garen Stone knew something was wrong even a decade ago. In May 2010, she was at the height of her power in the fashion industry, renowned illustrator and popular street star photographer whose images trendsetters like G- Carleen Ka- sorry, Carleen Whitefeld and Caroline Issa were becoming increasingly influential thanks to the rise of social media. Oh, and those two man, especially Caroline Whitefeld during the whole Vogue Paris tenure and when she left she had probably, I think Karen Royfeld might have had the best peer, the best sort of like post uh, editorial, uh, ed- editor in chief uh, breakup outfit run when she left or when she was ousted from Vogue Paris ever. I think so. So I think they even, I think that whole Vogue Paris era is when uh, Karen, Karen Royfeld ended up falling out with uh, Emiliana, Emiliana Alt, right? That's a woman. They kind of fell out. They're not friends anymore due to that whole conflict. Uh, Caroline Issa obviously has been, you know, she's been smashing the looks all in. But that Karen Royfeld era, just after she left uh, Roy Paris, before she launched CR Fashion, was epic, man. Some of the outfits that she had on, mama mia, just amazing. If ever there was a way to kind of like, if ever there was like, someone to look up to, especially if you're a woman in terms of an older lady who is able to look sexy without looking slutty, especially in the fashion world, especially wearing really short skirts, leather, black, everything tight, minimal makeup. Oof. Yeah. Anyway, continue. It's no wonder then that Dior was ushered through the airport like I was an old Lady Gaga by Dior after traveling to Shanghai, where then creative director John Galliano was set to debut his 2011 cruise collection. During the paid for trip, Dior recorded a video interview with Galliano, who at the time was allegedly struggling with substance abuse. After sensing his turmoil, she decided not to post the video. Much she said to Dior's dismay. Less than a year later, Gardena was fired by a multi-billion dollar company after making a public anti-Semitic rants recorded by a bandstander. Again, which is really incredible. Fair play to Gardena Store because I think especially in this era um, where you're kind of, um, where most, it feels as if most creators live and die by the engagement or by the clicks that they get or by the views or by the likes that they get on particular posts and they will basically do anything for views. For her to kind of make this decision like, you know what, this guy's going through stuff and I'm not sure if he's actually of sane mind. 
Uh, so I'm not going to post this. I don't want him to look bad. Is a real good credit to Garen Stoll, I think. And again, she was proved right because a year later, he's seen ranting Raven at a Parisian cafe, I'm pretty sure it was, uh, saying some pretty anti-Semitic things, right? <laughs> the kind of thing that most comedians will get their com- comedy special counseled for, right? Um, which, is, which is interesting because I think the fashion world is a bit weird like that. And they don't really counsel people. You can get away with murder, really, for the most part. And people kind of turn the other cheek. Um, even the fact that he's maybe still got a job now is kind of evidence of it. Because I think if any other industry, I don't think he would, he would have been that fortunate. Anyway, let's continue. Uh, blah, 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 blah. For the Corsican-born door who made her name in Paris before moving to stateside, the exchange with Galliano, one of the most gifted designers of his generation, was a turning point in the way she viewed the industry. There was this discrepancy of the image of the genius and this poor man, uh, she told the audience on Thursday. It literally broke my heart. Okay, to see this somebody again, it must do, innit? Imagine somebody you really look up to, especially in the, especially someone like John Galliano, right? And essential essentially he's a living legend. And to finally meet him um at the pinnacle of his career, quote unquote, um, seemingly so, and then for him to be such a broken man, um, especially after you watch you've absorbed because he's such an eloquent speaker, to see all these interviews and how he carries himself and to hear how people talk about him, to finally see him in real life and see that this guy's been beaten up and chewed and spit out by the fashion industry or by the fashion machine it's quite heartbreaking i can imagine that but it took a few years later uh for dior to come back um down to earth my fantastic love story with fashion had transferred into the world into a weird job she said she continued to attend extravagant press trips accept multi thousand dollar gifts from designers and sit front row at fashion week playing a game like every other circled influencer position so that's what you mostly get. She no one really mentions the money. So you usually get you get flown out to places, which is great. But again, getting flown out to see a Paris runway show and then not having any spending money is brutal. Trust me, I've been to Paris. It's not a cheap place to be to, especially during Fashion Week, right? Um, you have, you've got no time in between shows. You just have to pop in wherever it's open and get wherever you have to get to eat. And then you end up looking at a bill and you're like, bloody hell, right? A good indication is McDonald's in Paris. It's super expensive compared to any other city I've been to. So I can imagine... That could also kind of, you know, leave you a bit uh, dismayed as well with the industry. Um, you're getting flown to all these amazing places, staying in amazing hotels, but your bank balance doesn't really reflect your Instagram feed. Uh, here we goes. I kept taking shit, she said. Even though she was bored by the repetition of the Fashion Week cycle, the surrounding politics, by the end, people were walking, to, were walking me to my seat. She recalled illustrating a key indicator of power within the ranks of fashion and often provincial and petty industry. Years later, Dor finally broke down while getting ready to head to a Chloe show. She called Emily Note, her business partner in the lifestyle production publication of the prize Dor, and told her she couldn't do it anymore. It was then that she said, no, uh, let go of your fear of the industry, dis- discarding us if we don't play by the game. Today, Dor is based in Los Angeles and still very much in fashion. She writes about designers, works with brands on special products and relish- and relishes uh, thinking about and wearing clothes. Which is true. I think that's something that I think a lot of people, again, going back to the London scene, I think that's what a lot of kids really suffer from, especially when they're showing off schedule or off calendar. There's this idea that you're going to be ousted from the industry. No one's going to care. But I really do think, especially Gavin's spoken about this cyber truck, the only way to really make a dent in the industry, to really make some noise, is to kind of be on the outside. It's to kind of uh, make your own little, make your own little, uh, make your own little scene, your own little industry, your own little ecosystem that doesn't really uh, depend on the whims and the trends of the outside in the, of, of the quote unquote general industry. I think that's why I'm so in love with streetwear. Because by and large, streetwear effectively operates on its own calendar. People drop when they want. You know, people do drop, you know, two times a year, mostly around the same sort of time for spring and for fall. But for the most part, you can drop your collection however you pre, however you please. Sorry, you can present it any which way you want. Um, and again, it's the it's the it's the kind of it's the kind of idea that you've created your own little ecosystem, your own little brand, your own little gang that people can, you know, mess with or not mess with. And that's where the beauty of the street industry comes from. And then when brands come to you to come and collaborate, they have to meet you at your terms. You have to meet them at their terms, which is kind of the um, the thing that I see the issue with when you're trying to be an influencer or trying to be um, an operator in that kind of world. You kind of have to compromise yourself in some way, shape or form to kind of go up there. Because again, you're coming into their house. It's their fashion house. You have to abide by their rules. Um, it continues... Uh, today, Dawes in Los, Los Angeles and still very much in fashion. She writes about designers, works with brands on special projects and relishes thinking about and wearing clothes, which is awesome, right? You're still working in fashion, just don't need to be of fashion. But she does 
uh, does it on her own terms. That means not traveling to New York, London, Milan and Paris at, at least two or sometimes four times a year for grueling trade shows that Dor believes are increasingly irrelevant to the industry they serve. Imagine you're an influencer and you're already flying six times a year to New York, London, Milan and Paris. You might live in one of those cities, so it makes it a bit easier for one place. But you're not even a designer and you're already flying six times a year, not including all the times you have to get ready, which is quite mentally taxing. You have to decide what outfit to wear, what you're going to post. Are you going to bring a photographer or not? Uh, are you going to get your you know, your whole um, skincare routine done? Uh, do you have to buy some other bits and pieces? That stress, that you know, uncertainty, who you're gonna, who you're gonna stay, who you're gonna hang out with? You probably got a place to stay, and you're not even designing the clothes. Imagine what it must be like for an actual designer, a stylist, a makeup artist, fashion director, uh, publicist, PR that's actually involved in the running of that brand, the, the showroom assistants. It must be absolutely, it must be torture to do that all the time, season in, season out. And you just kind of rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. No wonder they're also highly strung or stressed out all the time, man. Mamma mia. Um, Dor thinks Fashion Week is the least interesting place to, today for the brand she works with to invest in their resources. I don't look at Fashion Week. Uh, this is not where I place my finger to fill the pulse anymore. She said the world has changed and it's flat again, which I agree. I think for the most part, you know, I think fashion weeks are still a good, um, like the movie theaters. I think they're still a good way to kind of present your work. Um, they're still probably the best way to present your work. I still think whenever you see Paris Fashion Week come around, I kind of equate it to Champions League football. That just happened this week. Especially if you're a fan of the Premier League. You do see a, a jump in quality, uh, a, you know, in terms of the team, in terms of the players. Everyone's really good when it comes to Champions League football. You make one mistake in defence and, and the opposing team, they capitalise, they score. All of a sudden, you're 1-1 one, one down. You're one, it's a 1-0 one -oh draw. You're 1-0 one -oh down or, or you're 2-0 -oh down. You know, that, that's how quickly a game can change. And I think you see that a lot in Paris Fashion Week. You definitely see the levels jump up a bit because it goes from Milan to Paris, I'm pretty sure. And Milan, for the most part, it's quite, you know, it's quite, um, it's quite safe, quite dry. It's quite brown. It's a bit, you know, meh. And then suddenly you go to Paris and all the A-star players are, are in operation. All the big brands, all the best talent are showing out consistently in, in, out, in, out. And that's essentially where most of these high street fashion brands are going to kind of, quote, unquote, um, take inspiration for the brands in order to kind of, you know, dilute it down into a big chain. So it does operate as essentially the touch point. But I think if you want to work in fashion, if you want to actually work with brands who are actually selling units and, actually sell to the common, you know, everyday folk and you want to live in that world and you still want to have, an, you know, you still want to have your day-to-day -day be surrounded by going to a studio, feeling fabrics, consulting on fabric swatches, um, you know, whatever it may be called or collaborating with brands and giving insights and taking part in uh, focus groups. You can still do that outside the fashion industry and that is a big part of the fashion industry because again, like I said, I think the fashion weeks are like 10 percent if maybe less of the fashion industry altogether so i wish more kids would see that and kind of carve their own little lane outside the industry so that we have a bit more of an uh, interesting scene because at the moment it's just a bit you know it's a bit man you need something else to shake up a bit but yeah um interesting topic or interesting interview with garen store i think maybe um i saw brian boy was a bit um put off by this i think if you're an influencer who sat next to her, you might think a, a bit of a front. She essentially is saying that you're not interesting people and she was a bit bored by their presence and stuff. But I don't see it like that. I think the influencer thing, if, even if you're a brand boy and you're still posing in expensive garments now, you're really about that life. Like you're still, if you're still, if, if you're a brand boy and you're still doing the whole fashion week thing and getting a haircut and wearing expensive clothes and spending your rent money on a, on a really nice um, Saint Laurent uh, jacket, whatever it may be, then you're really about this life and you deserve to be where you are. But I also think if you're a Garen store and you decided, you know what, after doing all of that, after being in the, at the apex of the influencer mountain, now to decide to go and do your own thing, you know, somewhere else and outside of the fashion week schedule and, you know, working with brands, having your own little studio, running your own little fashion consultancy brand. I think that's cool too. You've both seen different sides of the industry. You've both been in it for long enough to decide what you want from it. And the brand boy is happy to pose around in clothes and be flown out to exotic places and witness stuff front row. Fair play, do your thing. But also I think it's cool to see someone like Garen Store step up and say, hey, Fashion Week isn't always cracked up to be. Look at what I've done. I've also been able, and I've seen both sides. I think that's also appreciated for the kids because sometimes it can be hard to take that message of like, oh, you don't need an industry from a guy like me that's not involved, right? It could just sound like I'm bitter. Do you know what I mean? But if, you, if it's from someone like Garen Store who's been to the apex of the mountain, you're probably going to take more note of it. So yeah, definitely check out the article. I think it's really, really interesting, really, insight, really insightful. 
and really illuminating into you know how difficult it must be to be an influencer. Do you know what I mean? Six times a year to fly to New York, Milan, Paris, like whew, not including all the stuff that you do regionally or you do in your own country, whether it be like you know, freeze art fair, all that sort of stuff. Like, bow me, it's amazing, man. Amazing, amazing, amazing levels of stamina.